And this is what we're working on today, guys. And you can see I've got some tools laid out to show you kind of what we're going to be using. This is the grate to my fireplace. And here in Maine, we heat with wood as a secondary heat source. We also heat with heating oil or number two fuel. I pretty much burn up one of these every year. This is made out of cast iron. The way this works is that these used to come all the way across here and you know all of these connected from side to side. What happens is, is over time this gets used and it glows cherry red because these are cast iron. All the heat and cool cycles eventually they break and fail and then I've got to replace this about once a year and they cost anywhere from 40 to 60 bucks so what I'm gonna do is I've got some scrap plate and you can see that this is rough you can see it is super bowed and this is 10 millimeters thick or 3 8 I'm gonna cut a piece to fit down inside here now we're gonna cut this using this metal cutting saw. And you can see here it says it's designed specifically to cut steel. Then once we get that all welded into this, we we'll use that machine to do it. I'm gonna take this plasma cutter, and then I'm gonna cut in like some oval holes. And I'm not sure, I may even double this up. So that would work out to be three quarters of an inch thick metal then we would probably never have to worry about replacing it for two or three years. The reason you have to have like these tines in here because the air needs to get up through the bottom and go up through the fire. If you didn't have that there, it would kind of just like smother it and it would burn really slow and it wouldn't burn very hot. So that's what we're gonna be working on guys. So let's get going. All right, there is no right or wrong way of doing this, guys. So uh, we are just going to cut ourselves a piece of plate. Looks like 11 and a half inches. And for you folks that use the metric system, that works out to be 292 millimeters. So I'll make a little line at 11 and a half. Do the same thing on the other side. And we'll just make a straight line. I switched out the... Uh, white marker for black marker. I think it's just gonna show up better maybe for you guys to see it. But you can see how messed up this plate is, how bent it is. Check that out. You can see how it's touching all along the bottom. Then it's got a huge gap down here. This plate is pretty warped up. This is gonna be fun guys. I've never cut steel with this saw, but I have cut aluminum and it cuts like butter. The blade that's on it right now is a combination blade. It's made for mild steel, aluminum. You can use it for a bunch of different metals. I'll have a link down below if you want to check this out. This is a super, super, super budget-friendly saw. If you're looking to do something for metalworking and also have a general purpose uh, saw, because you can cut wood and metal with this. You can buy different blades like this one. This one's specifically for metal. So I'm excited to uh, see how this cuts. I mean, this is a big task. This is 3-8 steel, so we'll see how, uh, how this cuts through it. This is definitely gonna be faster than cutting it with a grinder and a cutoff wheel. Probably even faster than cutting it with a plasma cutter, actually. And another great feature about this saw, guys, is that this is all set up to be used as a track saw. You can see the, the base on the bottom. Right here, it's got these grooves in it, and I have the track, and I could actually use it, but I'm not using it just so I can show you that you can do this, you know, a basic way. The other option would be to just set this track down on this line right here. Preferably, you'd want it, like, flat and touching everywhere because it has, like, grippy material on the bottom that keeps it uh, held down in place. And then you would just take this saw and run it along the track and it'll give you a nice straight cut the whole way. If you want to see how this works in use on cutting large sheet goods, I'll have a video up above where I was cutting a bunch of aluminum for my race cabinets that I built. Now I'll set my blade so that it's just barely through the metal. At a bare minimum when you do this, you're going to want to have hearing protection, safety glasses, and a face shield as extra protection.
Let's see how we did. Oh yeah, that's gonna work good. Maybe we're gonna go this way, maybe? Yeah, probably that way. Oh, she's warped though, isn't it, huh? We'll work around that. We'll make we'll we'll make it happen. And I also decided that I'm not gonna do a double plate here. I'm gonna do strong backs on the back side, which is basically like strips of metal welded in. You'll see, it'll make it a lot stronger. As you can see, flipped it upside down and just gonna trace out this shape because that's the shape of the firebox. So I don't wanna keep it square and uh, not have it fit right inside the fireplace. I need to clamp this down, it's vibrating around. Let's spin this around and we'll do the other side. Alright, let's give it our test fit. Yep, that'll work just fine, guys. Might be a little bit difficult in places to get some weld on it, but we'll we'll work through it. I think probably that's the next step where we're at, is we're going to get this clamp together in places and start getting some welds on it. I'll walk you through the setup real quick. This is the Arc Captain MiG-200. One of the benefits I like, it's kind of dark over here. It's got an LED light inside the cabinet so you can see what you're doing. For wire, I'm using solid wire, 30 thousandths, which is also 0.8 in metric. This machine is really easy to set up. So here's your mode switch, and it'll tell you what processes you have available. So that's stick welding, that's TIG welding, that's MIG welding with a spool gun, and that's MIG welding with the regular method with a whip. This button right here is your wire thickness. So we already said we're 0.8, but you can toggle down through to 0 0.9, 1 0, so this 0 0.8. This is where you select your gases. So you've got CO2, C25, that's what we're using for gas. That would be flux core, that would be for welding stainless, and that would be for aluminum MIG. Then we'll throw this in synergic mode, and now there's the metric system, and we already know that that was 10 millimeters thick, so that's what we're going to set it for. There you go, and we're all set now. So when you open this up, you want to go all the way open. They have what's called a back seating valve. If you open this up just a little bit like you would for an acetylene tank, it can actually leak past the packing. So make sure you're opening your non-flammable gases like C25 and argon all the way so that the stem seals when it's open. You can see we've got just about a full tank, right around 2,000 PSI. We can see we have the gas, so about 19. We want to lower that. I'm pulling the trigger to activate the solenoid and we'll put it up to, let's say, 13. Yeah, about 15. That's pretty close. So I think the way to go about this, guys, I got it flipped around, is I'll kind of just get a few tacks on it on the bottom. And uh, then we're going to add to it and then we will cut out some slots with a plasma cutter to allow air circulation. I say these grates can get pretty expensive, especially when you're replacing them you know, at least once a year. If I can get, you know, two or three years out of this, I'll save myself some money. Although I'm putting a little bit of time in right now, it'll save in the other end. Best practices would have you clean this down to bright and shiny metal, super clean, and all that. But guys, look what we're working on. So when it comes time to doing stuff like this, you have to factor in a little bit of your time too, or at least I like to. I mean, is it really gonna make a difference if I grind this all the way down to bright, shiny metal? And, and it holds or if a couple of the welds end up cracking because this is already pretty weak and this is the weakest part that we're welding to. So this is gonna be absolutely fine, but if it was something that was critical and it really mattered, yeah, always clean your metal down, get it nice, bright, and shiny, but this is gonna work just fine for what we're doing here. And one other thing I really love about that machine, guys, is listen, it's actually what you don't hear. That machine is on and there's no fan running. The fan only turns on when it's needed, so that is like super awesome. I love that in the shop. All right, let's see if we can get this welded up, guys. Like I said, we're welding on cast iron here, so it could be a little tricky. We'll see.
Gotta turn it up a little bit. Still gotta go a little hotter. I'll bring you in and show you what I'm looking at. I'm running pretty hot for 30 thousandths wire. I probably should be using some uh, 35 thousandths actually. I won't be a total hat, guys. I'll give it a little bit of a wire brush just so I can get good starts. Just pounding the weld right to it, guys. Nothing special. Rather than take the wire reel off that and put 35 thousandths on it, I actually just switched welders. Because my other welder was set up with 35 thousandths, so that's what I'm using right now. Well there it is guys, it's pretty much all welded up. It's pretty rough. Just because welding cast iron is not uh, easy, especially burnt, really, really burnt cast iron. You can see how this is just kind of like all warped uphill. And I just tried to get some tacks on it here and there where I could. You can see this one was so burnt out that once I got the weld on it, it actually cracked when it was cooling and broke it. But it will work. Like I said, all it needs to do is just hold some fire. Now we're going to flip it over and I'm going to cut some ovals in it here and there. And then I'm going to take these couple scraps that we cut off and weld them on, something like that, just to keep this from buckling and bowing. That'll help give it a little bit of extra strength. This doesn't have to be perfect, but I'm going to try to give myself some lines to follow and go by. You know, just some like start and stopping points. So we'll put one there, and put one like maybe back here. And that'll kind of be like the end starting and stopping points right here. We obviously don't want to go all the way to the end because then it's going to weaken it and it won't be as strong. And for the plasma cutter, I'm using my Yes Well to cut 55DS. And it's important that we set this up properly because just like if you was using a cutting torch, you wouldn't turn everything up to full blast to cut sheet metal. So we want to preserve our consumables. So to save those, we need to set it up properly. That means the right amperage and the right pressure. So what I want you to do is head over to my welding community page over on Facebook. I'd love for you guys to join it. Uh, you can share all kinds of information on this page and we're going to get the file that tells us how to set up this machine or any plasma cutter for that matter. When you go in here you can see it's got reels, you can buy and sell, it's got photos, a lot of talented folks inside here with projects that they're working on and it is one of the best welding communities on the internet. These are all members that are sharing photos and their stuff within the group. I'd love for you guys to come over and join but what we're going to do is click on the files tab. In that there's all kinds of information that people download and upload and share. They're all safe. You know, for example, if you want to build some target stands, these are the plans for those, and it tells you how to build them. You can make a little side money, but what we're going to do is we're going to go to the plasma cutter chart. We're going to click on that. We're going to click here, and we're going to download it. And then you're going to go into download folder, and here is that chart. We're going to find 3 8 metal that we're working with, and there it is right there. And if we look down, we can see that it's 40 amps and 40 PSI. So if we want to maximize our consumables in our machine, we need to set it for 40 and 40 for 3 8 metal. I've already got the airline hooked up, so we're going to need to boost this up to 40. 38, 40. And for air pressure, let me check that. And we got to go up just a little bit. So we'll go around to the back and we'll increase that. And now this machine is maximized to cut for the material that we're cutting.
Alright, this thing is not cutting very well, so I think I'm going to have to put some new consumables in it. Yeah, these consumables are all burned up. They're no good. Yeah, this thing's kind of like a knife through hot butter now, guys. Now that I got those new consumables in it, this thing is cranking through it. I was getting a little discouraged back here for a minute. Yeah, now it's just slicing right through it, no problem. Now we'll flip it over and all the pieces that I cut out, we'll just weld those in, make like some ribs on the back side just to help strengthen things up a little bit. So we'll probably do something like, you know, like this in between these. That, that should work all right. Now when I weld these in, these will just kind of act like a strong back to keep those from bowing in between. It's going to add material to that, almost like, a, almost like an I-beam in a sense. And then I will take these little couple scraps and go horizontal with it. And that should keep this from bowing. Eventually it will. It's going to get hot and it's going to sag and eventually it's going to bow and be ruined. But we'll probably get a couple, two or three years out of this. And there it is guys, and you know what? It might not be pretty, but it doesn't have to be. It just has to work, and that is what is important. And that is it guys. When you are looking in the fireplace, this is what you will see. So that's why I say it doesn't have to uh, look really great, but those strong backs that we welded in here are going to keep this from bowing this way, and the little strong back that we welded on the back is going to kind of help keeping it going this way. I would have liked to have put one on the front, but all these little tines or the little front legs were kind of in the way, but uh, I mean, we could reverse it and just put one here on the top, but it's probably really not necessary, you know? I think this is gonna be adequate. Now I'm gonna go put it in place and see how this thing works, guys. So we sort of just had our first snowfall of the season, guys, and I uh, got it all snow blowed last night. Look how good that, that is burning. It's not even putting any smoke out the chimney. Maybe a little, but not much. That diesel tank that I was going to work on welding, I ended up uh, giving that back to the guy just because 
I had to flush it out with water and I can't do that inside my heated workshop. I'm, I'm just not going to weld inside my heated workshop with uh, a diesel tank. It's just way too dangerous. So I told him in the spring, if he wants to bring it back, uh, I'll gladly uh, weld that up for him in the spring. But I just, I just can't do it right now. But yeah, it's kind of like a winter wonderland out here right now. Here's my little fire pit in the backyard. Completely buried, but if you want to see how I built that, that was a fun build too. It's got that little thing on top. You can cook hot dogs and burgers and made out of an old truck rim. And this is all my wood for the winter. Uh, we've already burned about a half a cord. So there was another stack here in front of this. Uh, that this tarp just kind of goes over and the reason it's kind of like this is it just allows air to circulate in and all around this wood so it helps dry it out. But yeah, we burn about probably two cords of wood a year, but wood is our secondary source of heat. I don't know if I mentioned it in the, the beginning of the, the video, but we heat with uh, heating oil. It's super expensive. Uh, like a gallon of it is like, I don't know, four something a gallon. It's crazy. It cost me $600 to fill up the tank, and I fill that up about every month and a half. So it's pretty expensive heating with heating oil, but we don't have natural gas here in the state of Maine yet. At least not in my area. I'm in central Maine. That thing's working good, guys. It has a nice draft on it. This uh, fireplace will blow us right out of the living room if you don't kind of like monitor it. If you just keep shoveling wood to it, it'll blow you right out of the living room. It just gets so hot in here. So we just burn a little bit at a time, throw in a little bit. We have a you know, surplus in here. We kind of just fill it up pretty much to the top of that chair rail right there. You know something, guys? There aren't many things better when it's cold outside and the wind is blowing and it's just miserable and you start a nice warm fire. It's just a great feeling. And I wanted to share this type of video with you just so you guys could get some ideas of just using different tools, you know, getting familiar with it. May not be the best looking thing in the world, but it's gonna work and that's what matters. I wanna thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you're wondering about any of the tools that you see me using, I'll have links down below. There's new videos every Friday, so please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Until next week, guys, I will see you then. Take care, stay safe, and God bless. Come, come.